And we can talk about that because you look at that and you're like, well, how can yeah. anyone be against universal background checks? We are taking action. We are getting things done and we are trying to save lives. We're California. We're just going to go ahead and ban it outright, just in a different way that's going to be harder to legislate. So I wouldn't throw all my eggs in the Supreme Court basket if that's yeah. what you're asking. Today, Vice President Harris will also deliver remarks at John Lewis High School, where she will t talk about for the Biden administration about these issues we are discussing today prior. Federal court blocks ATF's pistol brace rule. The recent showdown in Texas had the ATF sweating bullets, metaphorically, of course. Picture this. A federal district court in the Lone Star State drops a bombshell, slapping a nationwide injunction on the ATF's pet project, the pistol brace rule. It's like the court slammed the brakes on the ATF's plans to roll out these rules across the country. Now, let's backtrack a bit. This legal thunderstorm brewed from a case known as Brito v. ATF. Sounds cryptic, right? Well, it's like a legal superhero showdown, with Brito swooping in and dropping the hammer on the ATF's parade. This case wasn't flying solo, though. It had its sidekicks from previous legal battles, like Mo backing it up. Mo set the stage, showing the courts were all about flexing their legal muscle against the ATF's pistol brace rule. And when Brito took center stage, it was like deja vu all over again. The court said, hold up, ATF. You can't just bulldoze through with these rules. And bam, nationwide injunction, a full stop to the ATF's plans. The thing is, this ruling isn't just a one-off. It's part of a legal domino effect. Mo paved the way, showing that these preliminary injunctions against the rule had some serious legal weight. So when Brito waltzed in, citing Mo's success, it was game over for the ATF's rule, at least for the time being. The court's decision wasn't just some legal jargon thrown together. It was a power move based on solid legal ground. That had you prove some type of special need in order to get a permit. If you get uh, not denied for a firearms purchase under NICS. The co-chair of the Second Amendment Caucus, Mr. Massey. That is so incredibly broadly written, um, it will ban. It is reported from the Rules Committee against any resolution reported. They don't care about that fundamental liberty law-abiding citizens in this country enjoy. Which again, you might say, well, how is that objectionable if we're keeping guns out of the hands of, of the criminals? Mm -hmm. California knows how to do these things well, and they know how to work around things so that they can just draft this new law. They didn't buy the ATF's pitch and said, nah, we're not letting this fly. It's like the court was the referee in a game, blowing the whistle and calling a timeout on the ATF's play. This nationwide injunction isn't just a bump in the road. It's a full-blown roadblock for the ATF. Imagine the ATF as this unstoppable force trying to push through these rules and suddenly, the court slams down a do not enter sign. Interconnected cases. The legal world's a bit like a puzzle, and sometimes it's all about connecting the dots between different cases. Take the Brito case. It didn't just pop out of thin air. Nope, it hitched a ride on the legal train that started with Mo. These cases are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, fitting together to paint a picture of legal drama. Brito didn't just saunter into the courtroom on its own. It had its BFF, Mo by its side, waving a flag and saying, Hey, look at me, I set the stage for this. Mo was the trailblazer, the one that got the courts nodding and saying, Hmm, these preliminary injunctions against the ATF's rule, they've got some serious muscle. So when Brito stepped into the spotlight, it came armed with Mo's success story. It was like a legal tag team. Mo laid the groundwork, and Brito took the baton to run with it. Contrast that with what Republicans did to address gun violence and crime the last time they were in charge. Uh, and they're turning it into 10 days plus a number of steps that you have to take in order to clear your name. And there's been quite a few amendments. Well, the last thing to happen just happened yesterday. Do you think we're our safeguard on this one? Is there's no way that the, the, uh, the Supreme Court will allow this or is... If you did, you still couldn't use it because you couldn't go about your daily life without crossing through some type of sensitive location Let's see what is the most compelling thing to learn from that case. How many times was this gentleman? Brito said, hey, remember what Mo did? Well, we're on the same page here, and boom, injunction granted. But wait, there's more. Enter stage left, the Texas gun rights case. This wasn't just another case filing papers. It was another piece of the puzzle, adding to the drama. This case brought a different flavor of legal contention against the ATF's rule throwing another punch into the ring of challenges. 
It's like these cases were all sitting at the same table, passing the baton of legal arguments and strategies. Brito borrowed Moe's notes, the Texas gun rights case brought its own arsenal of arguments, and together they formed this narrative of challenges against the ATF's rule. The interconnectedness here is like a legal dance, each case stepping in time with the others, building on the momentum set by their predecessors. They're like chapters in a book, each contributing to the broader storyline of legal battles against the ATF's rule. ATF's APA Violation Imagine you're playing by the rules, following a set plan, and suddenly someone changes the game entirely. That's kind of what happened with the ATF and their pistol brace rule. The whole fuss boils down to a little something called the Administrative Procedure Act. It's like the rule book the government has to follow when making new rules. So the ATF had this plan, this rule about pistol braces, but somewhere along the line they decided to go off script. They made some serious changes, like major edits in a final draft that no one saw coming. And that's where the APA comes in, wagging its finger and saying, hold up, you can't just flip the script like that. See, the APA has this thing about fair play. It says the government can't just pull a fast one and drastically change a rule without playing by the rules itself. It's all about transparency, giving folks a heads up before making significant rulebook edits. Now, the ATF's move to switch things up with the pistol brace rule rubs some legal feathers the wrong way. It's like they took the proposed version, scribbled all over it, and unveiled a completely different final draft. There's a hearing that you can't be at, your counsel can't be present, you haven't been charged with the crime. All kinds of firearms that take a, uh, detachable magazines. Now today, as you all know as well, we're also marking National Gun Violence Awareness Day. The last case that they rendered a decision in that was tangentially re related to the Second Amendment was in 2016. So in California, it was extremely difficult. California had to get rid of that good cause or just cause requirement. Then the White House walked back that statement and call on young people to continue leading efforts to end gun violence. That's a big no-no in APA town. This APA violation isn't just some technicality. It's a big deal. It throws the whole legality of the rule into question. It's like if you're playing a game and suddenly someone changes the rules midway through. Everyone's scratching their heads, wondering if that's even allowed. By straying from the initial proposal, the ATF opened up a can of legal worms. It's like they've jumped off the legal cliff without a safety net, and now they're scrambling to prove they had the authority to make those changes. ATF's Dilemma The ATF's in a bit of a pickle, a legal crossroads that got them scratching their heads, trying to figure out their next move. Picture this. They're standing at a fork in the legal road, and they've got two paths ahead, both with their own twists and turns. On one side, there's the appealing road, that means taking the Brito case straight to the Fifth Circuit, maybe even waving at the Supreme Court on the way. It's like taking the high-speed train to the big leagues of legal showdowns. But here's the catch. Recent actions in cases like Moe and Texas gun rights suggest the ATF's not exactly packing their bags for this high-stakes journey. Instead, they're kicking back and setting up camp in the lower courts. Yep, the ATF seems to have a soft spot for the lower courts lately, they're all about these summary judgment motions, kind of like trying to settle things down without ringing the bell for the big legal fight. It's like they're saying, hey, let's handle this in our own backyard, shall we? This preference for the lower courts is more than just a coin toss. It's a strategic move, a calculated decision to avoid the hoopla of the higher courts. Maybe they figure they've got a better shot at scoring points with their arguments in these smaller legal arenas. We filed formal petition for rulemaking through the appropriate channels. Of any semi-automatic assault weapon that was lawfully possessed before the bill became law. Personally, it's a little bit sketchy there too because, you know, the last case that the Supreme Court took and rendered a decision mm -hmm. on. Uh, of 2022. Now, when it was originally introduced, it was the worst carry bill that I have ever seen. Uh, and said he supports a ban on the sale of assault weapons, which there's no such thing. A real Second Amendment case was in 2010 in uh, McDonald v. City of Chicago. But here's the thing. The Brito case isn't just some minor league scrimmage. It's a heavyweight bout with nationwide implications. Going the lower court route might seem cozy, but it could mean missing out on the chance to swing for the fences in the big leagues. So the ATF's dilemma? 
It's like choosing between a cozy neighborhood bakery and a fancy restaurant downtown. Do they stick with what they know and cozy up in the lower courts? Or do they roll the dice and aim for the big wins in the Fifth Circuit and maybe even try their luck in the Supreme Court? Implications of Nationwide Injunction When a nationwide injunction drops, it's like a legal earthquake shaking up the whole playing field. But here's the thing. With great power comes great responsibility. That injunction isn't just a stop everything card. It's got some serious implications, especially for folks caught in the middle of this legal whirlwind. Imagine you're minding your own business, getting yourself a brace pistol thinking it's all good and legal. Then, bam, the court drops this nationwide injunction, putting the whole rule on pause. Now you're left wondering, what about my brace pistol? Is it still kosher? That's where exemptions come waltzing in like the cavalry. See, when the courts slap a nationwide injunction, they've got to think about the folks caught in the crossfire. It's like what happened in California with Freedom Week, when the court said, hey, those who snag magazines during this time, you're not in the legal hot seat. So, drawing a parallel here, the folks who got brace pistols thanks to the court's ruling might need a legal lifeline. Tearing apart families and making our streets less safe. The, the two things, Stephen, that worries me, worry me more than anything is, is the assault weapons. But let's just say that you actually did get a permit under the original SB2. Uh, and then 1446 <clears throat> is where they're taking the three-day uh, default proceed. I think worse than that, sir, you will see millions of otherwise law-abiding citizens. Uh, a, a definition, there's no definition on exactly what a uh, assault weapon is. They're like innocent bystanders caught in a legal storm the courts might consider giving them a pass, saying, you got those pistols fair and square when the rules were up in the air, so you're good. It's not just about hitting pause on the rule. It's about making sure innocent gun owners don't get the short end of the stick. So while the nationwide injunction throws a wrench in the ATF's plans, it might also come with a silver lining, a legal parachute for those who found themselves inadvertently caught up in this legal tangle. That's all for this video, folks. We'll see you next time.